please welcome Jim Matheson, special partner at The Engine. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second afternoon of The Engine's Tough Tech Summit. By now, you've had lots of wonderful conversations and covered lots of ground, and I'm really excited to have three amazing panelists and friends on with me this afternoon as we dive into the topic of private-public partnerships. So besides being uh, amazingly alliterative, this title is really important. And we're going to, over the next hour, deconstruct the idea of private public partnerships for you. And why this is so important for anyone operating in the tough tech uh, uh, arena. When you do the work you're doing, whether it's inventing new technology, translating that through innovation into a new company, scaling that innovation um, for global impact, or thinking about investing any point along the way of that life cycle, you're operating in some sort of a context. That context sometimes is a global context, sometimes it's a national context, and sometimes it's a state and local context. Inside of each one of those contexts exist and operate a variety of players. So for this conversation, we're gonna simply break those into two groups of players, um, private sector players and public sector players. And this conversation is really around how do those different players in those different contexts how do they operate? How do they support tough tech innovation and impact? And sometimes how do they actually hinder either intentionally or unintentionally the progress that we're trying to make? Every one of these players has their own missions, their own incentives, they have their own capabilities and their own limitations. If we do, or more precisely, if I do my job correctly over the next hour, you're gonna leave with a very good sense of how these contexts differ, who these players are, how they can operate together. And most importantly, you're gonna leave with a sense of what capabilities and possibilities are there for you to partner with these different folks? What capabilities are needed to be developed? Uh, and also how to engage either to access these capabilities or help to develop them. So in this endeavor, I have three wonderful panelists. Uh, first is Professor Fiona Murray uh, at the MIT Sloan School. She's also the Associate Dean, and I love this title of inclusion and innovation. Mm. So hopefully we'll hear from you, Fiona, how those two things fit together importantly. And uh, Fiona is uh, a, literally a global expert on entrepreneurship innovation, especially as it relates to private public partnerships. We also have Michael Brown, who after a long and esteemed mm -hmm. career in the commercial sector is the director of the DIUX, which is the Defense uh, Innovation Unit Experimental. Uh, so we'll hear uh, a little bit about DIUX's mission and Michael's perspective on things. And last but certainly not least is Tamara Steffens, who is the managing director of Microsoft's M12, which is their venture capital and innovation unit. So we're gonna to turn to our panelists here in a moment to get their perspective on my initial framing of how I think about, uh, about tough tech. So I'm teaching a new course at Harvard Business School on tough tech ventures. I have the pleasure of working as a senior partner at the engine. So this is a thing I think about a lot and when people ask me what tough tech is, I describe it as those enterprises which are trying to make a significant dent in important global problems. And in doing so, they're pursuing significantly risky technical undertakings. So that's the tough tech piece. But in addition to that, not only is there a lot of technical uncertainty in these enterprises, but there's a significant amount of commercial uncertainty. We don't know about the path to market. We don't know about the business model. We may not know how to access capital in the right size, shape, or form. And ultimately overlaying that technical and commercial uncertainty is a significant amount of dynamics related to regulatory. So there may be regulatory headwinds, there may be tailwinds. At a minimum, we have a lot of uncertainty in the regulatory mm -hmm. environment. So that's how I think about how I talk about the, uh, the idea of what is a tough tech enterprise. So I wanna to turn to my panelists to get started. We're gonna start Tamara with you, please. Um, so react to that framing and, and especially react to it through the lens of your role at Microsoft leading M12. What would you add or subtract to that? And why do you think that tough tech is emerging as being so profoundly important in the world today and to Microsoft? Yeah, well, you know, Microsoft, it, just the history of Microsoft is, we have a huge research and development arm, right? We actually just refer to it as Microsoft Research. So we have the ability to um, create, you know, opportunity for exploration. And you don't really have to be trying to develop a product for profit, if you will. Um, so because we're such a large organization, we we do that. And I, and I I think if you look back to the you know beginnings of Microsoft and the history, um, the goal was really to advance human knowledge without being encumbered by that commercial ambiguity. So I think from a um, 
core, we do believe in that. But ultimately, we're still, you know, a, a public corporation that is, you know, beholden to our shareholders. And we do need to um, be profitable, right, and continue to um, increase those profits, if you will. So trying to to balance that is always, diff always difficult because much of what is needed, uh, you know, and, and developed or what I would consider tough tech isn't always obvious to make a profit. And so, you know, it takes a, a, a village, as, as they say, to, to get through that. So as the pace of technology and innovation quickens, more and more research is finding its way into commercial products. So I think that's great. Um, but it's hard to separate, you know, pure knowledge pursuit um, versus advancing human knowledge for profit. So that's, you know, it, it's a little ambiguous, but ultimately public companies need to make a profit. And sometimes this innovation that needs to happen, um, that need to make a profit gets in the way. So Tamara, if I could stay with you for a moment. So what role is Microsoft wanting to play in the village? And um, it, how do you think about, I mean, very much a global company uh, originally born in the US, how do you think about the global village versus a national village um, and, and that relative to strategy and impact? Yeah, and if you, if you think about what we're doing, just I'll, I'll name a couple of fronts that we're really looking at, um, both with Microsoft Research and with our investments, right? We're, we're definitely trying to foster sustainability and combat um, climate change. And we have a separate fund that just focuses on that. Um, and we do, um, we put a lot of effort and research into supporting a healthy global society, which is critical. Um, and we want our technology to be trustworthy and beneficial, right? So when you think of artificial intelligence, making it safe. Um, so I think we are leaning in on a number of those efforts and, and trying to do them in a way um, through both investment and additional research, um, as well as just our actions, you know, in trying to be carbon neutral. I know there are a lot of um, uh, big companies, our, our partners and, and other companies we partner with that, that have the same thought process. But again, it's going to take a lot to uh, turn the ship on some of these problems. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to come back and talk and dive into some of those topics. Michael, let me turn to you. So, um, DIUX, so clearly focused on the defense you know, industry, the defense problem set, but very much dual, dual use foci. Talk a little bit about how you think about tough tech and, 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 the, and the kind of impact that you're trying to have with your organization. So Jim, I think your framing was quite a good one. And uh, I think one of the things that we've seen over the last uh, 20 years is that our private capital has largely moved to software in the US. So I feel like there's uh, a bit of a market failure in terms of the funding that's available for tough tech or hard tech. And uh, one of the areas of significant risk that I think we agree on is uh, hardware. Um, so while I'm sure there are some software problems that might qualify, and we're really talking about physical things here and the military needs physical things. And we can't always rely on a flat world where you can pick up anything you want from any country in the world. We've certainly seen the dependency that we're not happy with, with pharmaceuticals and antibiotics uh, after COVID, our dependency on China there. So uh, I think in a world where we need reliable sources, uh, where we need hardware as well as software, tough tech is, is incredibly important. The Defense Innovation Unit really touches this in at least two ways. One is we're working to bring companies into the Defense Department that go beyond the traditional defense primes so we're offering revenue contracts for companies that can help solve uh, current urgent military problems. And that often brings in hardware vendors. And then second, we have a new initiative that uh, we've been working on for a while, just got funded by Congress in 2021. It's called National Security Innovation Capital. Uh, it's a way for us to fund promising, but maybe risky uh, technologies that are exclusively hardware. And in doing so, we hope to attract more private capital. Um, the engine could be a partner, other folks, Microsoft and others who see the promise in these uh, technologies, we would welcome to come in and, and be partners here to take a critical technology and get it further along in its development. By doing that, we lower the risk and then other private capital can commercialize it. So those are the two ways that uh, Defense Innovation Unit is working to help 
the hard tech or tough tech segment and help them be suppliers for the Defense Department. Got it. Yeah, we're going to come back and dig into this question of the global context versus the national context, and that applies particularly acutely to you and your your stakeholders. So we'll come back to that. Um, Fiona, um, would love to hear your how you talk about yeah. tough tech and 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 how you're thinking. And are we teaching it different uh, down the river than we are here upriver? <laughs> I think we're probably thinking about it in a reasonably similar way. Um, what I would say is that places like MIT and Harvard and the other great research institutions um, have always been focused on really pushing forward the frontier of knowledge. Um, and if, if that's not tough, then we oughtn't to be doing it. If it's not something that is worthy of a PhD and a postdoc and some of the brightest minds, then it's not tough enough and we should leave that for some other organization to do. Um, I think what's very interesting is the fact that when we're doing that, we need we know we're taking significant scientific risk. But what this framing around tough tech does, I think, is that it reminds us that the technical risk actually is not just at the earliest stages. That even when those ideas get out of the university and into startups and in partnership with the government and with large corporations, that there's a huge amount of technical risk that is still there as we go through those technical readiness levels. Um, whether that be around sort of the unknowns and uncertainty around scaling, around the reliability, the kind of, as you said, the regulatory pathway, even how to test whether something is robust and reliable. Um, that I think is something that we really have to pay attention to. So even solving those later downstream problems continues to be tough. And so that's, I think, a framing that is really important and reminds us that it's not just the science that's difficult. I think from MIT's point of view, what we're, sort of wrestling with, I think, is back to your first part of the definition, which is the dent in big problems, which is actually to sort of ask the question, we need to be doing this tough stuff, not just for its own sake, but so that we can solve big global challenges. And I think we all agree on that. The question then becomes, what's the right moment to inject those challenges into that early stage process? Right? When, when do we sort of put those challenges in front of people? Do we sort of let all the research happen and then we say, well, oh, does this match up with any of our challenges? I think the conversation is increasingly happening on university campuses is that we need to get those challenges front and center of our research activities. But if we do that, we then need to figure out when to get these ideas out, when to hand them over to our other partners, and how do we make sure that they don't get stuck at the boundary and we reduce the frictions. So that's the sort of conversation that I think we're having um, is very much that. So where do we where do we focus our attention at that frontier? Um, when do we inject the problem into the conversation? Um, and then how do we reduce the frictions? Because as you said, this is a village. So how do we make sure we partner really effectively? Because that's where I think some of the difficulties lie. Yeah, we'll come back. I, I really want to dig in later into this, this concept that let's let's focus the research on, on the problem. One could say, well, the problems are obvious um, and, and maybe they're not. And how do we actually support that early way upstream innovation enterprise? Um, but we, we've already heard, I mean, talk about big challenges. So there's lots of big pr problems that we'd love to all put a dent in around the world. Let me just focus on two and compare and contrast. And uh, in our pre-brief call, Tamara and Michael had a, sort of an interesting back and forth on, on these two issues and whether they're actually different or not. First is climate. So climate is very much a global problem. Um, yet um, the U.S. and other countries have their own, their own mandates, their own politics their own self-interest about being a leader uh, in, in climate. And then on the other hand, there's computing. I'm gonna sort of call it supercomputing, semiconductor manufacturing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is very much to some degree like, you know, in, in the realm of the commercial, but is increasingly in the realm of national interest. So, uh, and, and also sort of Michael, your DIUX perspective, Tamara from Microsoft, di different, different orientations. So Tamara, I would come to you. Do you think those are, those are different enough that they demand different approaches. You've already said that Microsoft actually has M12, right? To focus what I imagine would be on the compute side. And then you have yet a separate investment fund for climate. So why the two funds? How do you think about you know, either Microsoft's or uh, you know, the world's approach to these two problem sets? Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, the, I think the climate problem you know, as as we discussed in the past, is is just enormous, right? It's huge, um, and it really is going to take everybody. You know, every big corporations, you know, public, private individuals, you know, all um, all rowing the boat in the right direction um, to make a dent. 
So I think from that perspective, we're not necessarily looking at our investments in climate to immediately get return on investment, right? In fact, that's not um, the way we, we make those decisions. Um, whereas M12 is Microsoft's venture fund, we are looking for a financial return. Um, we can still make bets on technology, uh, you know, that's that's bettering the environment. Um, but we first look to see, is this technology that's bettering the environment also going to make a profit? Um, so I think having both organizations actually gives us two bets that will that can can benefit um, climate. Um, when you talk about, you know, other things and, and you mentioned that the chip situation, the silicon situation, you know, that right, that that can even come down to really a national security issue now. Um, and how do we solve that? That's not going to be solved in a matter of uh, years, right? It's going to be tens of years. Um, and so how do we figure out who can, and I believe that's got to be a combination of government and private um, working together um, on a solution. So I think they're similar in, in the sense that you, you have two problems that require government and private, um, but you know, very different, um, very different approaches. I think because the climate is really a long term. I, I think we can solve the chip um, and silicon problem eventually, um, and, and in a period of time, we can set some some goals and we can get there. Um, it's not going to be easy. The climate, it's a world problem, right? It's it, like we've got to get every country, every person understanding the problem in order to solve it. Got it. So, Michael, you know, through, through your uh, personal aperture and also DIU's aperture, um, are they different? I mean, can't we just pile, I mean, you're a, you're a former computing executive. Why can't we just pile a bunch of money and solve the computer issue and then go focus on climate? How, how does well, it work? They're, they're both going to require a lot of money uh, <laughs> investment. I think the difference with climate is what economists call the externality problem, right? Uh, individuals, uh, firms, or, or people, the pollution, the, the uh, effect of global climate is not really priced into our use of energy. So that's where government has to get involved and help create a solution. I think that there's a role for the government to play in both these areas, certainly from a research standpoint, what are some of the solutions that we need and now we see from the, and, and also from a, uh, a standpoint of making sure that as one of the largest users, the Defense Department is the largest uh, energy user in the, in the nation. We need to make sure that we're uh, moving forward with greener technologies. Uh, and we're doing that a quick example from the Defense Innovation Units where we're working to retrofit Army vehicles right now with batteries so that they can be hybrid. Uh, that's not even... Uh, the latest technology, that's something that's been around the commercial world for quite a time, but it's not been uh, available to the military. So we're doing those retrofits now. That's an easy example. We also need to be uh, leaning forward with respect to alternative sources of energy that can be cleaner, like hydrogen. So uh, that's what I think the government needs to be doing there, including sponsoring research through DARPA and other organizations. On uh, computing, I think what we've seen, and if you want to talk specifically about semiconductors, which is where Tamara was going, what here we're seeing the limits to uh, the world is flat and the shareholder revolution. If we're eking out every last penny uh, from an earnings per share standpoint, we're not thinking long-term about capabilities we need for the country. And if we go with the world is flat, that only works if everyone is our friend and we can source these components from anywhere. Well, again, COVID has taught us some limitations there, but uh, if we're not alarmed by what we saw in the last week with the hypersonic uh, missile that China's launched, which uh, Chairman Milley just called uh, a near Sputnik moment, I'll go further. It's a Sputnik moment. Uh, if we don't wake up to the fact that uh, we're not going to be able to source whatever we need from any country, and I'm very concerned about the fact that you know 50% of the world's semiconductor, advanced semiconductor manufacturing capacity is a very short distance from mainland China and mainland China and Xi himself has said, this is ours. There's no question in his mind about uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, ultimate fate as being part of the PRC. So with that kind of danger and so much of our economy relying on chips, this really needs a national solution. 
So back to research, we need to be thinking about as we reach some limits of Moore's law, where does that go? What role is the U.S. and our companies going to play? Second, the supply that uh, I just referenced, very dangerous to have so much of our economy dependent on a supply chain uh, in Taiwan. Some moves are being made there. The CHIPS Act we could talk about, which is now part of USICA, U.S. Innovation Competitiveness Act, are starting to address that, but it's not nearly big enough to reduce our dependence to the degree it needs to be. And we need to be investing in domestic sources of demand. Uh, uh, modernizing the power grid would be a great example uh, for where we can uh, incent incentivize the companies to put fabs here in the U.S. because we have the demand here in the U.S. So just, just some quick examples there. I think they're different but related and both require investment in some national solutions. Yeah, we're going to come back and compare sort of the U.S. approach versus a China approach, you know, in, in competition and, and the, the emerging geopolitical tensions there. Fiona, if we stick with this question of sort of the broadly the compute problem and the climate problem, when we think about the panel, private actors, public actors, is there a different way that, that we should guide and expect private and public to work together in the compute arena? versus the climate arena, or in your view, are the mechanisms, the signals the same? Sure. I mean, it's an interesting framing, I think, because for me, I see compute in the kind of land of solutions. It's how I would decide to think about solution space. I'm using compute and computers for a whole variety of problems yeah. that I want to solve. And I'd see climate as a kind of a grand challenge in the problem space, much as I might say direct defense you know, security, climate security, food security would be a category of problems. In each of those, I sort of I think we need to understand, you know, as we think about a sort of a solution space that we're generating and we're investing in computing of a whole variety of um, modalities, you know, everything from traditional all, all the way through to quantum computing, we're thinking about supply chains and chips and so on. Um, but in each case, the problem that we're trying to solve is, is one of security, both at a national and at a global scale. And I think when we think about the, the problem domains, our question is always going to be, what are the interventions that we need to make sure that we don't have these externalities? Some of those are going to occur globally. Um, some of the externalities, I think, around defence and security are clearly sort of national if we don't make the appropriate investments. And then I think when I step back, I think the question we need to ask is, as we're trying to develop and continue to be at the forefront of, of um, some of these very powerful sort of domains like uh, quantum and, and other things. What is the, you know, how do we come together and what are the public private partnerships? I think that on the research side, those partnerships are quite often going to be structured in reasonably similar ways in the sense that we say, you know, here's an area where we really want to have some advantage and some competitive advantage. We're going to bring together different funding sources I think when we direct those solutions in particular ways, what we often get is a change in the mix of capital. So to the extent that I'm doing research where I'm then going to really focus you know, on nanotech and material science, I'm focusing on transparent solar or something like that, um, it's much more likely that I'm going to get philanthropic capital into the mix. And I think that sort of really shifts how I think about what I do at the university and potentially how I fund some of the early stage startups. When I'm doing it focused on you know, very direct to related to defense and national security, then it's obviously government DOD money that gets into the mix. So I think it's the mix of capital structures that starts to change when we look at applying some of these um, deep areas of science and technology capabilities to particular problem sets and challenges. So let me stay with you, Fiona, for a moment. If you if we think about private public. So yeah. in, in, in the US, private public are distinctly different. Uh, often work, you know, not well together. Um, you know, at, at its best, great things happen, but often you have very different uh, incentives and drivers. In China, to oversimplify China, private public is is nearly one and the same. Uh, so they can control resource, control uh, priorities. Uh, you know, direct research and development. The signaling there is much clearer. Um, if you were to compare and contrast, you know, th this tough tech opportunity and the ability to make a big dent. Um, it, Comparatively, China's system versus the U.S. system, what does the U.S. need to do to compete effectively? So I think that what the U.S. needs to do and what any right of, the, of our sort of Western democracies need to think about is basically how we send very, very strong signals about the grand challenges and the problems of our day that we want people to focus on. 
uh, I think we're going to have to send those signals in different ways. And actually, that is the benefit of our system is that we're able to send big demand signals and potentially have many, many different types of people, a diversity of individuals, a diversity of perspectives, of teams, many different organizations, the breadth of the university system, national labs, the private sector. Um, I think traditionally we've been quite weak in the signals that we've sent. So the US system has relied, I think, on you know a plethora of sort of sources of ideas and then let the market kind of take its shape. I mean, in a very sort of stark, overly simplistic characterization. Whereas I think the Chinese system has been much more directive and kind of connected the dots between the solution generators and those people who say these are the big problems. I think the direction of travel in the US and elsewhere is to sort of bridge that divide between the big challenges of our day and those generating problems, trying to be more directive, but in particular, reduce the friction. So I would just come back to that idea. And I think DIU does that. I think different private sector funds can do this, which is shape directionality and be much more clear and then reduce the frictions of me kind of going down these paths. Um, so I think if we can do that, we're going to end up optimizing a system that has relied upon a, a really rich source of different ideas. And I think that is our strength. But we need, I think, to be more directive about what we want those ideas to be focused on. Thank you. you I jump in. Uh, yeah, I was going to actually come to you, to Michael, and talk about how do you generate those signals? What's working and what's needed, do you think, Michael, from your perspective? Well, I'm going to step outside of uh, DIU's domain for sure. a minute to, to, yep. to say I, I got, agree with Fiona's recommendations, but I don't think they go far enough. I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that China's completely different system really ensures that there's very long-term political stability. Now, yep. in our system, we prefer to have a voice in what's happening politically that their citizens don't have. Um, but that allows the uh, Chinese Communist Party to make very long-term decisions about resource allocation uh, and make risky long-term investments, the kind that our government has made in the past that lead to unparalleled prosperity because over time, those become a foundation for private sector uh, industries and, and companies to emerge. Think about the benefits we've received from uh, DARPA working on the internet, the government launching satellites that allow GPS miniaturized electronics that we developed for the space race and, and frankly, to miniaturize um, uh, components for nuclear weapons. So those all have tremendous benefits for that long-term investment. That's what China is doing now, but to a much greater degree than we are as our federally funded R&D as a percentage of GDP has declined since the space race from 2% now to 0.35% for those investments made from a national security standpoint. The other part of our federal funded already going to health oriented initiatives like uh, would be recognized by NIH. So I think if we think about what do we need to do to compete in that, one, we need to make more investments as a federal government in these research areas. So you name them, quantum sciences, um, you know, autonomy, artificial intelligence, the list goes on would probably be a dozen critical technologies that we would need to think about uh, there to invest in. But the other is a key part of our investment as an economy comes from the business sector. As you point out, uh, Jim, I agree with you. In China, that's one and the same. In, in our economy, though, it's not uh, one and the same in the U.S. So we need the kind of incentives that give businesses a much longer term investment horizon. And if we continue to reward companies for eking out that last uh, penny per share every quarter, uh, that is giving them the wrong signal. So we really need to make it much more advantageous for companies to be investing on a 10, 20 or 30 year horizon. Uh, corporate investment is probably three to four X what we're investing uh, in the government these days, May could even be larger. So we really need to have the private sector on board making those long-term investments with us to ensure we're developing the national capabilities we need to compete with China. Got it, yeah, Tamara, let's bring you in on, the, on Michael's point that we need private enterprise, and that's Michael, the DIU rep. I'm going to come maybe back to Michael, the public company CEO later and see how you might advantage that as a public CEO. But Tamara, when you think about this, this investment from 2% down to 0.35% uh, from the, the government side, uh, Microsoft continues to invest heavily. Where do you look for signal and, and do you agree that there's more signal needed? Or do you think that Microsoft, which is a very market oriented company has got enough signal, you know where to invest. And is there enough incentive for you 
uh, at M12 specifically, but broadly at Microsoft to make make 10 and 20 year bets. How do you, how do you think about that signal and that long-term incentive piece? I don't know if you guys can hear me. Um, you're frozen, can you guys, but we Alan, you. can you hear me? Yeah, keep going, that's great. Okay, um, so, you know, I think from our perspective, um, as I said before, we, we at M12, we definitely make some Vanguard bets. So we're not just investing in things that are going to, you know, have a return on investment in five years, say. We are, we are looking at quantum computing. We are investing in chip technology. Um, we are looking at, you know, um, even vertical aerospace um, uh, electronic vehicles, um, or electric vehicles, excuse me. So we 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 do have you know a you know a, a sizable piece of our investment going into some of these what I consider horizon four problems. Um, but we still have, as you you and I discussed, we still have the issue of you know we do need to have a return on investment. So some of our investments need to you know have an exit in in a reasonable time frame. What's that in venture capital? you know, five to 10 years, right? Seven on average. So, um, you know, I, I would, I, I like to think that we're balancing it the best we can as a VC that is, um, you know, in, in business for profit um, and for financial return. But because we're with Microsoft, we do have some flexibility in the way we, uh, we approach um, our investments. I mean, if you think about it, um, I mean, the great thing about the U.S. is we do have top quality universities um, and talent. So we have that going for us. Um, but if you think about the U.S. global share of venture investment, it's held steady at 50 percent in the fat in the past five years. But that's well below where we were in 2004, which was like 84 percent. So those challenges for the U.S. market, even on the venture side, are there. Right. We don't we're not investing. Um, at the same percentage um, that we used to. But but I would say with Microsoft, we have an advantage because we can do a little bit of both. Jim, can I just jump, jump in? Please, Sorry, I, what I wanted to say is it, it seems to me that some of the stats I looked at recently is that at least on the US side, a growing fraction of venture money that's coming in is coming from corporate venture. So depending on exactly how you define that, that seems to me to be a really important and interesting shift because I think if you're in a corporation, you can at least create different structures that give you the ability to work at Horizon 4 and perhaps not fall into the trap that Jim has described, which is the classic classic venture capital optimized much more for software. And that for you to be able to do even the, the, the list of things you described to us, you must have had to have, you must have to structure yourself differently. And I think there's a real benefit, um, a real sea change happening in the US economy. It's quite important. Yeah, Fiona, I, I agree with you. I, I think uh, there has been a huge influx of corporate venture um, money into the system. And it is true, the bigger corporate venture funds like Microsoft, we have some flexibility um, to, to invest in those Horizon 4 um, Vanguard bets, if you will. And I see the same from you know Google and, and Amazon um, in the way they're approaching it from their, their venture funds. Um, so I, th I think that's going to turn out to be advantageous. And again, we do have a climate fund that's significant I as far as investment, and 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 they're they're able to do even further out, right? Really think about, you know, what are we investing in that's going to have an impact on climate and sustainability and the environment as a whole, right? So um, I, I agree with you 100% that it should benefit the overall economy and the overall system. Yeah, I think the if you just look at climate specifically, and I think it, it transcends. If you look at the the amount of effort right now with chief sustainability officers in the Fortune 1000, uh, Fiona, as you point out, the the activity in uh, actual venture capital coming out of corporations, I think it's a very positive sign. I almost think we have like a like a triangle rather than private public axes. Uh, so much of my time, energy uh, as a CEO or as an investor, or board member, is trying to figure out how do we get the small innovative company to work well with the big company. That can often be more challenging than big companies working with public entities, right? So I think we've got to have all three of those types of organizations figure out how to work together, align incentives, speak the same language, work on the same timelines. Um, 
So th we, we've got some questions coming in through chat. So I'd love to hear from the folks that are watching um, and we'll sort of integrate those into the conversation. There's a great one here uh, that I'm going to summarize, but it's a topic I want to get to. And Michael, I'm going to come to you. And then I also want to, to hear Fiona's perspective on this. So we've been focused you know, to be provocative on US-China, sort of this, this axis of tension. Um, but the US has many allies. Uh, we have uh, military allies, we have geopolitical allies, not the least of which is our special relationship with the UK. Um, so, Michael, if you think about this, how, how does the UK use its relationships, you know, in the military sense to accomplish the things you're wanting to do? And then Fiona, I'd love for you to pile on and think about the US-UK relationship. Does that change the game? Does it make it more complex? Does it give us additional capabilities that we need to think about? Well, definitely uh, is a key to uh, competing effectively. So it's the asymmetric advantage that the US has that China doesn't. I mean, what, what named allies does China have? North Korea? I'd be much, I'm much more happy with the uh, set of allies that we have in the US. The question is, are we working those relationships as effectively as we can? There's so much more that we could be doing. So in a global strategic competition with China, which is what President Biden calls the relationship with China, strategic competition, couldn't agree with him more because this means it's much more complex and encompasses more dimensions than we ever thought about in the Cold War, which you could argue was ideological and military. We have those dimensions with the competition with China, but this is much more about economics and the technology underpinnings for the economy. So in that, we need to be working with our allies much more closely on standards. Uh, this is where China is focused. Now made in China 2025, has been complemented by China standards 2035, as they've seen the power of developing standards and what that's done for them with uh, 5G and Huawei's global preeminence. So take note, they wanna do that with 10 or 15 industries, not with not just advanced communications and small drones uh, that they're dominating today. So what's the answer? We need to be working closely with allies. That enhances our research budget. We need to be working with standards. We can make sure that we're not duplicating. And then we need to create a market for the small and large companies to be trading with each other without barriers so that we're encouraging a uh, globally economically viable uh, set of competitors to compete with what China's putting forth as subsidized global champions like Huawei. There's a lot to do with allies, really key part of the answer. And Fiona, what would you add to that? Just as we just look narrowly at the US UK relationship that you've worked so deeply and, and long against. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, the, the, the UK US relationship, people give it different labels on either side of the Atlantic special, uh, now re referred to as the Atlantic Alliance. I mean, incredibly important, sort of long history. And very interesting around technology. I mean, the TIS admission took radar technology from the UK in sort of 1940 and brought it over to the US so that that research project could continue for real strategic advantage. Um, if you broaden that out to five eyes and things like AUKUS on sort of nuclear submarines and what have you, and then maybe wider to NATO, it, it strikes me that that's all incredibly important. And just in the UK, US, I think it becomes important again to broaden out the diversity of ideas and solutions that we're generating not only within universities, but actually also in the startup venture community, the, the, the small new ventures that I know, Jim, you know, we spend a lot of time together thinking about. And I think that gives us a little bit more space and potentially allows us to extend our pools of capital if we have trusted capital across the Atlantic. I think if you think on the market demand side, I think there's some very interesting opportunities. And I've been talking a lot to NATO about this, is can we ex extend the size of market that we're thinking about. So if you thought about all the NATO countries, does that give us, again, bigger market signals, um, more market power, so that companies have something to aim for and potentially get to those sort of exits that um, Tamara needs quicker. Um, but in between, I think there's also this regulatory piece, which is, I think a lot of this doesn't work because you have regulatory complexity that isn't harmonized we haven't paid attention in standard setting bodies. We've sort of all been a bit asleep, I think, while a lot of people have taken over. And so it requires a level of coordination and a level of focus. I, I think our alliances have to be quite focused and targeted sometimes, you know, be below the kind of narrative of the alliance. We have to then think about what we're going to do and how we have an appropriate sort of comparative advantage for different partners. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we've been operating, you know, sort of in the 50 to 30,000 foot range. So as a former fighter pilot, I'm, I'm going to just sort of 
push the nose over and let's kind of get down into the weeds for a little bit. Um, Tamara, I'm going to come to you. If you think about, we, we, we've heard friction. So what are the frictions to making all this happen? And I think, you know, do we, do we, in the U.S., do we have the talent? Do we have the technology, technology signals? Do we have capital? Do we actually, uh, are we supporting these tough tech endeavors with the right access to customers and markets? Where do you think the frictions are? Where would you focus your time and energy to start to reduce frictions to accelerate, you know, tough tech innovation and impact? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think we have the talent, right? We have some of the best universities in the world and and uh, which yield visionary founders. So I, I don't think that's an issue. We have top quality investors. We still, as I mentioned before, um, have 50% of the venture investment in the world. So um, out of the U.S. market. So I, those I don't think are um, issues. I, I think where we we run into we maybe create some of our own problems i think uh fiona pointed it out the regulatory issues sometimes you know if you think of the regulatory issues that that pop up that creates a blocker right for technology and sometimes you can't you can't do um it is it, it, it regulatory issues can be the ultimate determinant of whether or not somebody is actually going to pursue innovation in a given space, right? So you can experiment and dabble when it comes to the technical commercial uncertainty, but that regulatory risk is not as forgiving. And I do, going back to China, um, they just don't put those blockers in place um, as much as, much as you know, we do. Um, so I think that that's an area where we really have to think about it. I think one of the other things that wasn't mentioned that is, an issue um, for us is that we value privacy and we have a lot of focus on data privacy and 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 how to um, manage that, not just with regulatory, but just in general. Um, and, and and that's not an issue in China, right? That's and and it helps, you know. Sadly, it helps their innovation move faster, right? Because they don't they don't um, have issues with data privacy. So that I. I didn't answer it specifically, but hopefully I gave you enough to think about yep. from, you know, the overall investment perspective. So Fiona, you and I have talked a lot recently about all these issues, but talent in particular, the human agent, as you call it, and are we getting the right mixing in there? Do you agree that we don't have a talent problem? And, and where do you think these frictions reside and how to fix them? I mean, I think that we have, um, I think, we have wasted opportunities. So let me just say, so if you, I, if I look from my, if I put my inclusion hat on and think about this from a diversity and inclusion point of view, it's really clear that there's some very significant talent sort of left not being as engaged as we want in the innovation economy. I mean, my own uh, work looking at sort of patents and production of PhDs tells us that certainly by gender, you know, we, we're up near 50% of STEM PhDs being uh, um, awarded to, uh, to women. And yet we're still only seeing about 14% of new inventors um, being female. And so we know that there's some sort of talent being left behind here in a way that just makes no sense. So it may not currently be a shortage or a crisis, but I do think that there's a hugely wasted opportunity and lost opportunity. I think that opportunity is going to really become even more salient as we start to, you know, or as we continue to have these, I think, very difficult conversations on campus and on university campuses about, you know, our mix of, of US versus international students and how we think about that um, and where our talent comes from. I think we aspire to continue to be global universities, but we have to do that in a way that is not naive, uh, but and yet allows us to still be an inclusive place. And the other place where I think there's a tremendous friction that I see all the time where I do think that there's a problem is in with our entrepreneurs. So when we have individuals leaving the labs, you know, wanting to be entrepreneurs, setting up some of these tough tech companies, um, those that are not US nationals, um, can sometimes have a really difficult time. The, an entrepreneur's visa in a simple sense does not really exist at the moment in this country. And it is a it means that people have to leave and you can go through all kinds of, of hoops to try and shift that. But at the moment, there's no simple mechanism. And so I think what that's doing is it's pushing that entrepreneurial talent elsewhere and where there are fewer frictions. And from a US competitiveness point of view, I think that's a real problem. Got it. Michael, same, yeah, come to you. Like, is, is there a single friction you're focused on or you, you have a portfolio of well, I just want to uh, uh, agree with Fiona here. Uh, as a nation, there's not enough technical talent. We need to be 
thinking again like we did in the 1960s in the space race on how do we stimulate more, particularly STEM talent. And we've let our universities now educate a lot of foreign students. Um, much of that can be very positive if we have the right immigration approach that we're welcoming them as entrepreneurs and contributors to our economy. We need to be careful about those who are here just to steal technology. Um, so that's a different kind of defensive posture we need to take with respect to adversaries. But with respect to uh, our friends around the world, we need to be welcoming that. We need to be encouraging more U.S. students to be focusing on the STEM fields instead of sports or investment banking or other, other things that are in vogue. That's going to be important from the standpoint of developing national capabilities. And we need to inspire those students by setting some national moonshot goals. Why for each of these technologies that we think are game changing, whether it's quantum science or bioengineering, why don't we have moonshot goals that uh, we've set in place to encourage another generation of students to really focus in these areas and help us make critical improvements. That's what's required for the strategic competition with China. With, with respect to the, the barriers oh, that I'm yep. thinking about, at the Defense Innovation Unit, I'm very focused on how difficult it is to do business with the Defense Department. We need the capability of the entrepreneurs who are listening here, the hard tech that's being invested in. We need that capability in the military. If we just continue to turn to the same five suppliers and they're critical, we need them too. We need what Raytheon and Boeing are doing, but we need the innovative horsepower of everyone working in uh, the Boston area and Silicon Valley and other innovation hubs. We got to make it easier. That's what DIU is all about. I will say I'm not worried about job security from the standpoint of having knocked down all those barriers. We've done a decent job over the last six years, but there's so much more to go to really make DOD look more like just another customer. Good progress, but we are nowhere near where we need to be. Michael, let me stay with you. So the, the moonshot goal, the Apollo program. So it sounds good. So President Kennedy, Rice University gives this you know, now famous speech. I mean, it was a lot more to it than, you know, a, a, a wonderful speech, a lot of money, a lot of incentives. So let, let's dig deep. Like, so we're going to say that let's go solve big problem number X. What else has to happen? Like this focus very tightly in on capital. What are the incentives? What are the missing capital mechanisms to go people for them to pay attention and to actually invest their time, energy and, and life into these problem sets? You no, know, we've, we've touched on it. And it's going to be difficult in an environment where you feel the federal budget is constrained. But we have to start making some trade-offs to put more into the future of the country, which really means we've already talked about it. Federally funded R&D, we need incentives for businesses to also be investing for the long term. I'm excited that uh, we have venture capitalists focused on a five or seven year time frame. But again, what are we going to do to change so that we're focused on a 10, yeah. 20 or 30 year time frame? That's what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. Uh, I'm happy the more they get involved and think they're going to make the right decisions instead of having that be market-based, yeah. but forgetting about that for a minute, they are focused on the long-term and, and we need those incentives as well. So it's a combination of investment that we're making, talent, and the focus that comes from a national agenda that's focused on how are we developing those capabilities? Yeah. How are we stimulating innovation nationally? And also how do we commercialize what's going into our universities and national labs? I'm sure we could improve what's happening there. The combination there would make a real difference. So we can focus you know, very specifically, Michael, on so more money is always better, right? Or to a point. Like, is there a program that the audience you know may not know enough about that you think is working that should be amplified and and replicated? Like, are there some mechanisms that we could actually pour more money into, or do we need innovation and actual the the incentive mechanisms themselves? Well, if you think about uh, the Endless Frontiers Act, for those who've uh, been following that. This was really an attempt to revitalize the science and technology enterprise across the U.S. Kind of, in, in the, the name of it comes from Vannevar Bush after World War II. What do you think is a key contributor to our success in World War II with the U.K.? Uh, it was really our investment in understanding uh, how science and technology was going to improve our capabilities. And of course, you see that with the, with radar, with the jet engine, obviously with the nuclear weapons. So. It's realizing how critical that is. That was recognizing the importance of that tie between government, business, and academia. That important triangle uh, we need to revitalize. So I think a lot of the uh, institutions are there. We have world-class educational institutions, as we've talked about. 
We have national labs. Uh, we have an incredibly vibrant business sector that is innovating. But how do we pull those together for a national purpose that's really aimed at uh, ensuring that we have the lead with our allies in the strategic competition with China? So I think we have to think about revitalizing those. Again, it's investment, it's talent, and it's focus uh, on goals. So Fiona, what's it going to take for us to get the, the best and brightest at MIT and other universities just around the city and around the country to focus on these issues? You've talked about signaling. Is it simply saying, hey, focus on climate or focus on you know new materials for, for transformer uh, performance? Or is there a set of incentives either at the university level, uh, you know, the government will need to be implemented or innovated to get people to pay attention? I mean, first, I think let's talk about the faculty and the sort of the research engine that is our you know, great university uh, sector. Um, it's very clear that uh, faculty actually respond pretty significantly to new sources of funding. I mean, basically, I mean, I think back to Susan Hockfield when she was president of MIT, deciding that energy and was an important goal. We went from having a very small number of people doing work that they would identify as energy and climate related work to over 200 um, you know, upwards of almost a third of our faculty having some of their work directed that way. And some of that was about planting a very big sort of flag. And some of it was about money. Um, I think back to the point about long term funding. Um, one of the challenges is that even as government is trying to commit to giving additional money to research and development, that money is often given in very small pieces. And sometimes people will argue, I think, that philanthropists and others uh, where the money comes from to do the long term stuff and government money actually is now quite short term because you have to have results to get the next grant and the next grant. And so I'm not suggesting that you know academics should just be given money to sit about and you know not have to show results for a decade. But I do think that making some long term, larger scale commitments is probably important when it comes to the students. My own view, and this is my my personal view, as opposed to a, an institutional view, is that people generally major in kind of disciplines in the solution space, right? In material science, mechanical engineering, and what have you. But what if everybody also had to major in a challenge domain, so that you've got those challenges front and center? And so, especially our very technical young people understood what it meant to think about matching problems and solutions, kind of to how you decompose a big challenge into manageable pieces. I, I feel as if we're not, we don't have that conversation enough. And when we do it, it's rather fleeting. And I personally would like to see us think about our education in that way. So that we're giving people a challenge space to focus on in addition to their kind of, you know, um, deep technical or other expertise. No, I love that. Um, Tamara, if you think about the best researchers at Microsoft and other like organizations that you interact with, you know what what compels them to focus on big and difficult problems is that is that a top down thing is, is it that they get the funding internal to microsoft what what drives that how do we get more of the best researchers in the bigger companies focused on the biggest problems yeah it's definitely top down and it always has been at microsoft um and i love fiona uh what you just said about students maybe having the major in a in a challenge in addition to a, a specific um, area of focus. Um, it's interesting because we work with Microsoft Research quite a lot on what they're looking at and the direction they're going because we don't invest unless we have a thesis behind it, right? So why are we investing? What is the problem we are investing in that eventually is going to have return on investment, right? So what she's saying with students, you know, invite or like focusing on a challenge area, that's exactly exactly what venture capital does. You know, what is the challenge? What's the solution? Where is it going to make a profit, right? What's the exit once you invest? Um, from a research perspective though, they're not they're not always looking at an exit, right? So we we have the advantage of being on the venture side and having this very deep research bench and being able to involve them in our in our thought process and what we're looking at and then actually get their ideas, say what could we go invest in that is in that horizon four that's going to make a difference, but also, you know, we know is um, you know, if someone solves the problem, it's gonna be worth um 
a, a great return on investment. So, you know, that's, I think, how we look at it, you know, from an overall perspective. But, yeah, it's always been top down at Microsoft. I think it's the same at, at many of the big tech companies as far as as they've gotten bigger. They're trying to solve big problems. They do have a lot of money from a budget perspective to put into research, but not enough. Right. I mean, as Michael pointed out, it is going to take a lot of money, right, to, to solve some of these problems um, in, in in the long term. So we're going to have to have some sort of cooperation between um, the government and, and private industry in solving some of these bigger problems. So Tamara, I'm going to stay with you for a moment. And what, what work is being done at Microsoft in an area that might surprise uh, folks? And sort of in the in the cone of silence here, like if, if we went to Microsoft, what would we be surprised that's happening there? That's a big, big endeavor that, that folks might not think Microsoft would be focused on. Is, Tamara, is, is there something happening at Microsoft that people would be surprised at that research is being focused against? I can't tell you our secrets. <laughs> oh no, I no, of course not. I I I, I was kidding about the cone of silence. Um, so we don't know. So there's something we're, big. We're happening big. We're big in privacy. Okay, <laughs> got it. Got it. And, yeah. and like Michael, if you I, think if, about the. If you know, I tell you, I'd have to. I, as they say, me. if I tell you, I'd, I'd have to kill you, right? So. <laughs> I, I, I get that. I get that. So that was an attempt to try to solicit inside information from Microsoft, which didn't work. So you passed the test. Tamara, well, well done uh, there. So we're coming up um, against the end of time. This conversation has gone super quickly, but we've covered so much ground from really thinking about the different dimensions and contours of uh, what tough tech is and why it matters you know, to the world and also to, uh, to the US. Um, lots of conversation, interesting conversation about sort of frictions all along the, the tough tech uh, life cycle. And there's a lot of work to be done there in particular around feels like capital, the human capital and uh, the financial capital is some real innovation needed. And I think obviously the engine is a great example and, and all of our financial partners that are doing interesting things, including IFC and others really making nice innovations in the capital value chain. Um, so to wrap, um, what I'd like each of you to think about is, so we're gonna leave here in about three minutes and then Senator Markey is gonna come online. Senator Markey has been a great friend to innovation and telecommunications, really drove the wax from Marky, the kind of the only real attempt at some carbon pricing that happened. So if, if you could give Senator Markey a magic wand to take to Washington, and he could accomplish one thing in Washington to forward our goals, to reduce frictions and make tough tech more real and put a bigger dent in the world, what would that be? And we, since we only have a, like a couple of minutes and we can make it super, uh, super uh, pithy. So Fiona, let me start with you. What what magic what magic capabilities would your wand have for Senator Markey? I think what I would like is to get at least the top three massive priorities and challenges, um, so that I can put those in front of my next generation of innovators. And I want those challenges to be sort of laid out at the big national level in a way that's really exciting, but then kind of described in some real use cases that real humans kind of could then sit down with us and, and share with us so that we could have the beginnings of some extraordinarily creative conversations. Got it. Signaling. We want strong signals. Um, Tamara. I, I would I would repeat what Fiona said, but in a different way. If we understand what those challenges are, he brings those back to us. It really does help um, the private sector understand what to invest in and what to focus on. And if we start investing you know, it's going to for profit, right? And and for return on investment, hopefully we'll get that talent that Fiona is going to develop them creating the companies that we can then fund. So really, I agree with her 100%, make those priorities known and yeah, those challenges. So important. We talked about the private public interface. I mean, we talked a lot about incentives and different behaviors. Often it's just the right, the common language, uh, convening and finding the time and space um, uh, and, and the patience to have the conversations between the public sector players and the private sector players is so important. So you can, a lot of times the government feels like it is, is sending a signal. The bat signal's out there, but no one's seeing it because it's just in the wrong language or pointed in the wrong direction. Uh, Michael, what would you, what would you give Senator Markey? Well, I'd try and tie this together. I think the signaling is important. That means you've thought enough to know what you want to focus on. You have an agenda. 
but you brought in the important uh, aspect of behaviors. If you want the behaviors to change, it's more than the signaling, you need the incentives to line up. So now we need, what are we gonna change about the incentives so that more young people are studying STEM fields as an example? What are we gonna change about the private, the capital market incentives so that companies like Microsoft have longer term time horizons for which to realize investments. So we need to get the incentives lined up to get the investment, the talent, uh, and uh, the, the long-term ideas uh, to be more in sync to accomplish the, the goals that we want nationally. Excellent. Well, we go back to the very beginning, which was to dissect this private-public partnership piece and understand the different contexts that we're operating in. So we talked a lot about global and national context. We talked a lot about the incentives and behaviors and connection between all the players. And I want to thank Fiona, Michael, and Tamara for this wonderful conversation and the engine for hosting us. So enjoy the rest of the day and say hello to Senator Markey for us. <laughs>